The waters surrounding Yonaguni Island off the southwest coast of Japan are difficult to reach and even more difficult to dive. But the sapphire blue salt water of the East China Sea holds a bounty of natural wonders for those who come here. This undersea world has rarely been seen by people outside the tiny Japanese diving community that claims this part of the ocean for their own. In 1987, scuba instructor Kihachiro Aratake sets out to find ways to attract more divers to Yonaguni. Nature amazes me. I see the fish and the many forms of sea life change here every day. So we were exploring diving points to use the ocean to attract tourists. Kihachiro Aratake is looking for the breeding grounds of hammerhead sharks that populate the ocean here. He believes that the opportunity for divers to see these unique creatures close up will be his key to riches. But what Aratake discovers instead is even more unique, even more spectacular than anything he could have possibly imagined. When I first saw it, I had goosebumps and felt strange, wondering why something like this exists underwater. To Aratake, the stone megaliths he discovers look like the remnants of an ancient ceremonial structure. When I saw this for the first time, it definitely looked like ruins. So I named it Iseki Point, Ruins Point. Iseki Point is located in 80 feet of water, less than a half mile off the coast of Yonaguni Island. Part of Japan's southernmost Ryukyu Island chain, Yonaguni is a tiny jewel of an island, Japan's westernmost scrap of land, barely 100 miles east of Taiwan. Just six miles long and two miles wide, you can drive around the perimeter of Yonaguni in less than 40 minutes. But what the island lacks in size, Arataki hopes to make up for in what he feels is the historical importance of his discovery. When I saw it for the first time, I had a strong impression of the pyramids, and I felt like I was in Egypt. It is a great mystery that there is such large object near such a small island. Masaaki Kimura is a professor of physical sciences at the University of the Ryukyus in Okinawa, Japan. In 1992, he is the first scientist to explore and measure the underwater phenomenon. This one is the body. This, yes. Ah, okay. The main structure is over 500 feet long, almost the length of two football fields, and taller than an eight-story building. To Kimura and his team, this is more than a collection of interesting rocks. Our studies show proof that the monument is not artificial, but is man-made. But Kimura's studies, published in Japanese and circulated only within his own academic community, fail to reach the West. Photographs are circulated on the World Wide Web where they attract the attention of Western divers. Among the first on the scene are husband and wife team Gary and Cecilia Hagland, underwater photographers who have made more than 9,000 dives around the world. The first time that we dove on the monument, it just seemed like I was in some sort of a science fiction movie flying across uh, some city, this massive, massive city. And when I got back up on the boat, I just, I, was, I had no words to describe it. Iseki Point is kind of a magical place to dive. Uh, there are times where, because of the, the difficulty, you're, you're really in survival mode, but there are times when the conditions abate just enough where you can just stand back and look and watch the monument and imagine what or who might have created this. There's no doubt in my mind that this is man-made. There's just absolutely no way that this could just happen to be here. Their photos are seen by Boston University geologist Dr. Robert Schock, who has done pioneering work on the dating of the Sphinx in Egypt. 
I hear a lot of, um, should we say, rumors and people tell me things about stupendous finds that turn out not to be true, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just dismissed it as one more thing like that when I first heard about it. Then I saw photographs of it, and the photographs really looked fascinating. The photographs of the monument also impress Graham Hancock, a former correspondent for The Economist and author of a series of books on Earth's oldest known structures. Hancock immediately takes a crash course in scuba diving so he can see the monument for himself. My first impressions when I first saw the main uh, underwater structure at, at uh, Yonaguni were of, of complete awe. To see very clean, almost right-angled, sharp edges, to see every appearance of design and uh, organization in a large stone structure underwater uh, ra raised in me a, a tremendous sense of excitement and mystery. The closest parallel, I would say, is the kind of feeling that, uh, that I get when I walk into a great cathedral or uh, into the Great Pyramid of, of, of Egypt. Since 1997, Hancock has made more than 150 dives at Yonaguni, discovering more than just a single stone monument. We have specific, distinct structures with extremely puzzling, anomalous features that I believe cannot be explained by nature, found spread out uh, along five kilometers of the southern coast of Yonaguni. And since they're all submerged, uh, it suggests to me that they were all made at roughly the same time. I honestly think that we are looking at a huge ceremonial, ritual, religious area. But the fact that the Yonaguni monument is underwater raises an extremely difficult scientific question. If these stone structures were in fact created by humans, then they would have had to have been carved when the monument was above water. According to Kimura's estimates, that would date the ruins to the Ice Age, when sea levels were much lower because much of the world's water was still locked up in the ice fields of the Northern Hemisphere. That means that the last time the Yonaguni Monument was above water was approximately 8,000 BC, predating Egypt's pyramids by more than 5,000 years. The monument might be 10,000 years old or older, which would make it the oldest structure in the world. But dating the Yonaguni Monument to the Ice Age flies in the face of the timeline currently accepted by mainstream archaeologists. Large-scale man-made constructions of this nature require a level of organization and planning in society which historians presently are unprepared to accept could possibly have existed 10,000 years ago. Uh, and therefore, proof that these structures are man-made, and indeed, if we can get to it, that they may be 10,000 years old, is by definition going to force a revision of history. The common knowledge is that the southwestern islands have no history of old civilizations. So if a 10,000-year-old civilization existed, it would be a big surprise. It would be unbelievable. According to experts, around 8,000 BC, we were primarily hunter-gatherers, nomadic, unorganized clans who had only the most rudimentary stone tools. Certainly not the kind of society capable of creating the Yonaguni Monument. The general scenario for the rise of what we would call civilization or sophisticated civilization is that it begins in, the, in Mesopotamia and Egypt around 3000 BC. John Anthony West has written a number of books about the monuments of early humans. And West, like Hancock, believes that there is ample evidence throughout the Earth that a sophisticated Ice Age civilization could have existed, a civilization described for millennia in the oral histories of many cultures. It's very important to remember that there are large number, large numbers of ancient traditions that refer to a lost civilization destroyed by a flood. But until the discovery of the Yonaguni monument, tangible evidence to support these ancient myths was lacking. There was no known evidence of megalithic structures, monumental building, even, say, in the 3000 BC range. And if this was going back to maybe six or 8000 BC, that was even more stupendous. When we continue, 
mysterious pyramids, temples, and shrines around the world with eerie similarities to Japan's mysterious pyramids. I think that there's a ton of evidence out there that says that ancient people were in constant contact with each other much further back than we like to believe. Over the years, as I've spent more time at Yonaguni, I've become more and more convinced uh, that it is the work of human beings and that the real mysteries that confront us now are not, was this made by man, but when was it made, who made it, and what was it made for? Professor Masaaki Kimura believes that the latest possible date for the creation of the Yonaguni Monument is around 8000 BC, when this part of Japan was still above water. But if this date is correct, and if the monument is man-made, who are the men who built it? For an answer, it is necessary to turn to legend. Around 360 BC, the Greek philosopher Plato writes down for the first time what until then had been only an oral tradition in the West. It is the legend of Atlantis, a civilization of technologically advanced people who flourished around 10,000 BC. But this vision of a great prehistoric society is not Plato's alone. Atlantean-like legends exist on every continent. And in Asia and the South Pacific, there is a rich tradition of ancient texts that all tell a strikingly similar story. It is this shared vision of the distant past that leads some to explore the possibility that such a civilization may have existed in fact as well as fiction. In my mind, it's quite conceivable that there are some very ancient, relatively sophisticated cultures and civilizations that we've missed up until now um, that had existed basically when extinct, if you would, or collapsed before the rise of better known civilizations about 3500 BC. Ancient writings from China describe a place called Pengsha, an island to the east inhabited by human beings who could fly and had a potion for eternal life. The inhabitants of Easter Island believe that they are the descendants of a kingdom of gods called Hiva. The oldest of all Hawaiian sacred chants recounts the arrival of a magical race of people from a floating island to the west called Mu. Yonaguni monument may be conspicuous evidence signifying that the Mu continent existed. Yonaguni potentially could tie in with this. In fact, I'm very certain that we should at least look to see if there's something there of sort of a, if you want to call it proto-culture or proto-civilization that we're all descended from. And whether it is called Mu, Pengja, or Atlantis, all of these legendary places share one common thread that the great and ancient civilization of which they speak is destroyed by a terrible flood. There are more than 600 individual flood myths found all around the world. We feel that the flood legends and the cat catastrophe legends, because of their universality, should at the very least be taken seriously and, and looked into seriously. And again, physical evidence at Yonaguni fits the legend. If the monument was created above water during the Ice Age, then it is possible that it was destroyed as the Ice Age came to an end. The ice was stable uh, for more than 100,000 years, and then suddenly, about 17,000 years ago, it all started to melt down. Although the total meltdown took 8,000 years, there were three global super floods during this 8,000 year period. So people living on coastlines would have been taken by surprise. There was one occasion when the sea level uh, rose uh, almost 100 feet, uh, literally overnight in geological terms. But again, according to legend, while a cataclysmic flood submerges an island nation, there are survivors, and these are the people cast adrift by the tides of change, who spread their legend and share the knowledge of their civilization around the world. Even more important, you might say, than the physical evidence and the legendary and mythological evidence is the evidence for that shared knowledge. The universality of pyramids and the universality of mathematical and number symbolic systems to me is very strong evidence of the universality of, of some ancient 
civilization. Researchers like John Anthony West believe it is no coincidence that when the next great civilizations rise more than 7,000 years later, they build similar structures, even though, for example, the structures in Egypt and Angkor Wat in Cambodia are thousands of miles apart. And many of these edifices bear an uncanny resemblance to the architecture of the Yonaguni Monument. On Okinawa, there is Nagagusuku Castle, a ceremonial building from the first millennium BC. On Pompeii Island in Micronesia, there is a grand expanse of ancient but undated stone ruins known as Nan Modao. And perhaps the most striking of all is the Temple of the Sun near Trujillo, Peru, a pre-Incan building of irregular terraces an ocean away from Yonaguni. There must have been some kind of transmission of knowledge um, from generation to generation, which says something, in my opinion, about the level of sophistication and culture um, of a group that's transmitting knowledge. In addition to architecture, many of these disparate structures also share a similar function. It's a simple fact that uh, a great many ancient megalithic structures, whether you're looking at Stonehenge in Britain or the huge megalithic temples of Malta, not only do they consist of large stones that have been cut and worked by human beings, but also they are organized and oriented in relation either to solar or to astronomical directions. Here again, there seem to be parallels to the monument of Yonaguni. It is the case that between nine and 10,000 years ago, uh, when it is extremely likely that Yonaguni was still exposed above water. Yonaguni Island itself was exactly on what was then the Tropic of Cancer, the ancient Tropic of Cancer, and this was an astronomically significant uh, location. The people who made this monument may have been interested in using it for directional bearing or because of some type of astronomical significance. Near the monument, there is a stone which we call sandstone. Now, I'm not sure if it was used as a sun dial or for some religious purpose, but the long hand of the stone does point to the north and south. Could it be that the monument of Yonaguni is the birthplace of the Atlantean legends, flood myths, and shared knowledge of the past? Or is it simply a collection of rocks and a collection of coincidences? The mainstream scientific community is inclined to believe the latter. Archaeologists and, and historians regard themselves, rightly, as the specialists in our culture on the past. They do like to feel that they know everything that needs to be known about the past. And so the idea of a very major forgotten episode is uh, a bit threatening, I think. And when a very interesting phenomenon like the underwater structures of Yonaguni is found, instead of rationally and intelligently investigating that phenomenon and coming to conclusions, most academics just write it off at the outset and don't even want to know. There are instances, however, where academia has explored the mythical places of the past and found them to be real. In 1870, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann excavates a network of ruins near Hiserlik, Turkey, and discovers that the mythical city of Troy is a real place. More recently, in 1992, Earth imaging radar helps to unearth the mythical city of Ubar, which according to Islamic legend was destroyed by God and swallowed up by the desert. If similar scientific efforts are made at Yonaguni, could there be a similar result? Our archaeology is, present, is at present uh, a rather uh, crippled and limited thing if it focuses its attention only on evidence from above water. We have to look at the areas where human beings lived before they were flooded. So I think what the Yonaguni monument is telling us uh, and in a very in-your-face kind of way, is that there may be a large part of the human record of the story of human civilization which is presently withheld from archaeology because it's underwater. When we continue, geologist Dr. Robert Schock makes his first underwater dive at the Yonaguni Monument 
and makes an unexpected discovery. It was very beautiful, it was very interesting, but it was nothing like the photographs I had seen. Yonaguni is not the first underwater monument to claim a connection to the lost civilization of ancient legend and lore. In the 1960s, amateur archaeologists tout this rock formation in the Caribbean as the Bimini Road, a man-made highway to Atlantis. Geologists insist it is fractured beach rock. And in the 1980s, Russian divers claim they have discovered structures of Atlantean proportions off the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic, but still have yet to produce photographs from that expedition. Is Yonaguni just another Bimini Road, or is it the smoking gun? In 1997, Dr. Robert Schock arrives on Yonaguni Island. He is the first Western academic to dive the monument, perhaps because he prides himself on working both inside and outside the mainstream. I think of myself as coming from a very traditional background. I've got a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale. Um, been doing a lot of very traditional academic work. But in 1989-1990, I first got involved with the Great Sphinx of Egypt. Traditionally, the Sphinx is dated to 2500 BC. By my dating, looking at erosional um, patterns on the rocks, the amount of uh, erosion, the nature of the weathering, doing some uh, fairly sophisticated seismic studies, etc. I've come to conclude that the oldest portion of the Sphinx is at least 5000 BC. So I was already used to looking at sort of, um, should we say, unconventional things. Certain people, I think, as a compliment, refer to me as an open-minded scientist. I take that as a positive. Um, so I was not someone that was going over there should we say, dogmatically skeptical that this could never be the case. I was open to the possibility that here in Japan we had a very ancient structure. Almost immediately, however, Dr. Schock notes something that will be a harbinger of discoveries to come. I went right down to the coastline and you could see very dramatically the waves tearing at the rock and breaking it off and actually forming this step-like structure. On his first dive, Dr. Schock is escorted to the site of the Yonaguni Monument by Hihachiro Aratake, who discovered the site in 1987. They dive with writers John Anthony West and Graham Hancock. As they approach the monument through a narrow passageway, each has his own impressions. On each side of the passageway, we see two courses of megaliths piled on top of each other, and the joints between the megaliths are at, at exactly the same level on both sides of the passageway, completely roofed over uh, with uh, flat blocks, rather, of the, the same shape as the classic goalposts of Stonehenge. What I see is rock that seems to have fallen naturally, in some cases harder rock, maybe sliding down softer rock and naturally working its way together as it collapsed on itself, forming a wall-like structure. Through the passageway, the first view of the monument is the stunning megaliths dubbed the Twin Towers. This is one of the, one of the many factors that, that convinces me that we're looking at a, at a man-made structure here because I find it very difficult to imagine how nature could have contrived to lower those two megalithic, rather neatly shaped blocks uh, into position side by side, just four inches apart. I found a lot of natural vertical fractures and it started making sense to me how this beautiful structure, an incredibly regular structure, could in large part, potentially be the result of natural processes. Schock finds the same natural processes at work on the monument proper. The way the beds are formed, the natural rock layers are formed, they flake off nice and horizontally, they're crisscrossed with nice vertical fractures and joints, they weather and they erode such that I believe you get nice step-like structures there will be what looks like an absolutely perfectly clear-cut, perfect horizontal, perfect vertical, but when you stick your mask down next to the corner, you see that it hasn't been cut, but it, rather that a chunk of rock has been wrenched out of the, away from its natural fault lines to produce this extraordinary formation. However, based on his own dives at the site, Professor Kimura questions the erosion theory. 
at the bottom of the monument, there are no rocks. If this were a natural creation, big rocks falling off of the monument would gather at the base. Where the Yanaguni monument is located, you've got incredibly strong currents and driving forces to actually split the rock, to pull off pieces, to wash them away nice and cleanly. You know, in nature, you can form magnificent structures, but that doesn't mean they're artificial. And according to Schock, the right angles visible in photographs are actually deceptive. But could nature form the sharp right angles that argue so compellingly to some for artificiality? I could not see the rock because it was covered with corals and sponges and algae. And they've actually, in my assessment, homogenized the surface. So it's like having sort of a rough, cruddy surface and you skim the whole thing with cement in this case natural cement, these biologic organisms, and makes it look even more artificial, makes it look even more regular. But several areas on the surface of the monument do not appear to Kimura to be caused by erosion or smoothed by sea scum. There are three holes, all approximately 70 centimeters in diameter and lined up in a row. These kinds of things do form naturally when there's a harder concretion, as it were, of uh, like a, a boulder embedded in the shale, and the action of the water pulls the boulder away, and you end up with a perfectly round hole. Two of the holes are round, but the third has a hexagon shape, which could not have been created naturally. I think perhaps this hole was used to erect a post. We find an internal right angle uh, cut into the rock. Now, external right angles, one might argue, could result uh, from uh, erosion or wave action, but to find an internal right angle in a protected area uh, is very puzzling indeed. Again, shock sees nature taking its course. I looked at those little holes in great detail underwater on several different trips, and I see no evidence of actual chiseling that they're artificial. My hypothesis is that, is that what we have here is a natural weak joint or weak layer where little organisms have gotten in there, they sort of space themselves relatively regularly. So you've essentially got what are a series of regular holes, but I think they can be explained by natural means. On the upper terrace of the monument, there are additional shapes and forms that also look like carvings. Now, when I look at these, to me it's more, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, it's like looking at clouds and seeing shapes in the clouds. Were I to focus on any one area of the Yonaguni monuments, I might be persuaded that it had been made by nature. But the combination of so many different features uh, in this one area, for me, uh, makes it extremely unlikely that nature could have done them all. And if Hancock is willing to concede some natural forces at work on the monument, Schock is willing to hold out the possibility of some artificiality. There's a few little things like some scar marks, potential scar marks that um, Professor Kamir has pointed out to me that could be artificial. We can't, in my opinion, exclude the possibility that there was some should we say, utilization, even if it's primarily a natural structure, by ancient humans. It was exactly the opposite of what we wanted to find, but up to now, we simply haven't found the kind of evidence that would allow us to, <laughs> to go on believing what we wanted to believe. Just because it looks like history doesn't mean it is. In July 2000, an expedition team sent for this History Channel documentary is invited to Yonaguni to see the ruins for itself. And its cameras are the first to record a recently discovered structure called the stage. When we continue, exclusive footage from the expedition to Yonaguni and a new discovery is made. Wow, and I actually discovered something here myself just by shooting video. The expedition sent to Yonaguni for this documentary begins ominously. There is a typhoon warning. 
Approaching clouds and choppy seas do not bode well for the team of three local divers, including Aratake, and three underwater camera photographers, including Yonaguni veterans Gary and Cecilia Hagland. The weather conditions were bad. The typhoon was coming, but the whole crew was there, and I wanted you to dive while it was still possible. So I took you there in spite of the big waves. We thought we weren't going to be able to get into the water any other day based on the weather report at the time. As we motored out to the spot, it became uh, more than obvious that we shouldn't be diving that day. <laughs> when we got in the water, the current was so intense, uh, there was no way that I could have even imagined a current that great. I thought I had experienced good current here before, but that was just totally intense. The team first dives on the main monument and manages to capture many of the underwater images seen throughout this program. We estimated the currents to be maybe six knots, which is, which is very considerable, and of course you can't swim against that. Uh, those were some of the most extreme conditions I've ever experienced in over 20 years of diving. And yet the mysterious beauty of the monument is still palpable to Yonaguni first-timer, photographer Tom Holden. There was just a sense about the place that you felt that there had been other peoples there sometime. Conditions worsen. Aratake signals the crew to surface. The ride back to shore is somber. The chance to be the first film crew to photograph the newly discovered stage area will have to wait for another dive. The next morning, Gary Hagland is philosophical. Working on a monument underwater is always a roll of the dice. It's a crapshoot. Sometimes you'll get something, sometimes you wish you were somewhere else. Uh, yesterday, I think we wished we were somewhere else. But in the afternoon of the second day, a minor miracle. The typhoon unexpectedly changes course, and the skies and water clear to a brilliant calm. Aratake believes this has happened for a reason. I think it was because of your attitude toward the monument. You were being good. God knows that. Motoring out to the site, the team has its first clear views of the unique coastline at the southwesternmost tip of Japan. At the southernmost promontory, the terrace rock bears a slight resemblance to the monument just offshore, but it is the 100-foot high rock in the foreground that is most startling. Reminiscent of the Moya of Easter Island, observers are divided on whether it is natural or shaped by human hands. This time, the current is less than two knots, and the water is a clear, clean blue. The sun had come out, the water had calmed down, the visibility was awesome. Uh, for somebody with a camera, it was just like a dream. Being able to have your camera and be in the water in those conditions uh, where you want to be. And I, I, was, I was totally thrilled. Aratake leads the expedition to a site approximately one half mile from the main monument. As the divers approach, a large, flat, two-sided structure comes into view, what is called the stage. When we dove the stage, that you know, blew my mind away because I truly felt that there had been a presence there, a human presence there, many, many years ago. Maybe it was an altar. Maybe it was a stage. I don't know. Maybe it was a place for a throne. But I felt that this had been touched by the hand of man a long, long time ago. I was following Eritaki very closely as he pointed out the different features. And he was motioning at his, at his eyes and then pointing to this perfectly carved out area in the rock. I, I thought he meant, come look at this. So I, I came in closer with the camera and I realized, oh, He's saying these are eyes, they're eyes. But I was so close I couldn't really see this. So as I, as I swam back with the camera, all of a sudden it just like materializes. There, carved in the side of this stage, is a perfect face. There's no doubt 
in my mind that this is man-made. There's just absolutely no way that this could just happen to be here. When I look at those faces, those brooding faces, uh, instead of Egypt, I think more of what you see in Central America, especially some of the, the Mayan uh, stone sculpture. And then along the side, another enormous image. It looked like some sort of a headdress or uh, bird wings coming off of the face, carved in the stone itself. And nobody that I know of has mentioned that to date. So it, to me, it was exciting. Like, wow, did I actually discover something here myself? For the rest of the day and the next, the team explores the area around the stage. Measurements are taken. The platform is 70 feet across and 70 feet wide. The team also photographs for the first time a solitary stone that appears to have been purposely placed atop a massive plinth. And Arataki discovers what he believes to be a statue of a turtle. There are also niches in the rock that some believe could be petroglyphs. It really needs to be studied because there's more here than, than folks know. And I think this is going to just really rewrite the history books. To have this experience that we had was just was otherworldly. This one ranks as probably the most unique experience I've had on any of my shoots. When we continue, Arataki reveals a final surprise on the shores of Yonaguni Island. Wealthy people spent many years to build those beautiful tools. As fortunate as I've been to travel all over the world and uh, and see some of these wonderful places and have these great dives. This, this is one that is unforgettable and I can only hope that we generate enough interest so that they can maybe unlock this mystery. When people come to see the ruins, most of them are skeptical about the ruins. But when they actually see them underwater, 99% of them are fascinated when I see them go home fascinated, I feel very happy that I discovered it. After three days of surveying the monuments, the production team surfaces and heads back to shore. They review their footage with Kihachiro Aratake and look on with excitement at the newly discovered images they observed at the Yonaguni stage. Oh. Dr. Kimura wants to have all kinds of information from all kinds of people. I was privileged to dive with a great team and to have two new discoveries made. I will report it to Dr. Kimura right away. Then, on a windward hillside above the Yonaguni Monument, Aratake takes the team to one of the island's oldest cemeteries. The tombs are not dated, but appear to bear striking similarities to the underwater monuments only a half mile from Yonaguni's coast. These tombs and ruins must be related in some way. There are certain tombs on Yonaguni that in fact are not like, not exactly like the traditional Okinawan tombs. Um, as far as I can tell, they seem to be older, they're carved out bedrock, and in fact, they have sort of stylistically, if I could use that term, a very, I think, a similarity to the Yanaguni underwater structure. So even if the Yanaguni monument is totally natural, it's a reasonable hypothesis to assume that it was being maybe viewed, utilized, you know, walked around on, be it mired, by the ancients that were there and being imitated to a certain extent. Is the monument of Yonaguni a natural rock formation that at most was a source of inspiration for early island inhabitants? Or is it the world's oldest artificial structure, the work of a legendary prehistoric civilization? At present, there is only educated speculation. To really know the significance of this mysterious site will require a comprehensive study by mainstream scientists. To date, no such study is planned.
the question of considering a phenomenon like a series of submerged anomalous structures off the coast of a Japanese island uh, and, and the fact that very few academics have been prepared to spend even a minute of their time looking into that, to, to me this is a huge failure of science in, in, in the world today. In Japan, there are only a few archaeologists who can dive and study the monument firsthand. So other academics who haven't seen the monument with their own eyes are drawing conclusions based on imagination. If they come, dive and hypothesize with us, I'm sure my theories about Yonaguni will take a positive direction. I'm quite sure about that. Only time will tell the true significance, the true magnitude of this discovery. But I'm confident that as the years go by and they discover more and more that this monument and the other structures at Yonaguni will help change our perceptions of world history. If all of a sudden I get word and see good images and convincing evidence that say R. Taki or Professor Kimur has found some kind of inscription or carving on the side of the Yanaguni monument that's absolutely definitively artificial. I think it'd be great. I'll applaud it. I'll be on the first plane I can be on to go see it. They have been obscured by a mist of mythology. They are hyper violent. If you don't surrender, he's going to hack you to bits. Pirates were cutthroats, murderers, thieves. They were enemies of all mankind. True Caribbean Pirates, tomorrow at 8 p.m., as only the History Channel can bring you.